good afternoon, everyone here and the people who are joining us online. Uh, so, that, uh, so my name is Arturo Sorazana. So I'm an associate professor at the Department of Politics here at NYU. And uh, I'm very grateful for the Jordan, uh, Jordan Center for organizing this talk. Today, we're going to have a talk by Anastasia Vasenko. Anastasia is a postdoctoral student here at the Jordan Center, and she studies gender electoral politics and democratization with special interest in politics of Ukraine and Russia. So Anastasia has received her PhD from Florida State University in 2022. And before that, in fact, she was a, a massive student in international relations here in New York University. And before that, she was also a master's student of European affairs at, at Lund University. And she also studied at uh, the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy. And before coming here to the Jordan Center, she worked at the Herdy School in Berlin as a visiting researcher. And uh, she has been also a Fulbright scholar here in the United States. So uh, welcome Anastasia. So today's lecture is going to be about the electoral effects of decentralization looking in the case of, of Ukraine. So of course, uh, those of you who have followed Ukrainian history and Ukrainian politics know that decentralization, the, the, the degree to which different regions of the country, different subnational units should be autonomous from the central government is something that sort of haunted. It was part of Ukrainian politics ever since the early 1990s, and it has profound implications. That debate has had profound implications on how, how politics actually operates in Ukraine on the ground and how citizens perceive their politics. So I'm really looking forward to learn more about this interesting topic today. And uh, the floor, floor is yours, Anastasia. Welcome. Thank you very much for introducing me. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. And uh, um, I'm very grateful that you came to this talk. So um, today, um, I will talk about decentralization and its electoral effects in Ukraine. And before I jump into the details of uh, how decentralization actually affected um, elections in Ukraine, local elections to be more specific, and what kind of implications it had for Ukrainian people's resilience in the wartime, I would like to just give some very brief intro very brief discussion of what decentralization was in effect. So Ukrainian decentralization reform falls into this wide category of reforms that were introduced with the hope of uh, eventual European integration of Ukraine. The EU was a driving force behind this reform. Um, there were multiple initiatives to motivate Ukrainian politicians to actually do that. And uh, currently there are multiple efforts by the EU to actually prove that this reform was successful. This reform was in fact successful. It reached the majority of its goals, was a very little drawback. So I'm kind of proud of what I'm talking about here. So um, the reform had two main goals. Uh, the first one was administrative reform and the second was, uh, one was fiscal reform. So administrative reform was designed to break up with the authoritarian legacy, with the Soviet legacy of this hierarchical, very vertical uh, system of administration, um, when all decisions like central planning are uh, being made centrally, and then um, local uh, level politics basically mean very little in terms of uh, decision making. Um, so um, how it happened, basically, small territorial communities were amalgamated or united into a larger unit. And currently these uh, united units are uh, in, in effect semi-autonomous. They, uh, they um, have a broader political um, uh, abilities to engage in uh, self-governance with, with very uh, obvious consequences for political outcomes. Well, um, the whole reform was taking place um, on a voluntary basis. And uh, this, like the whole uh, algorithm here is kind of convoluted and complicated, but I'll try to guide you through it. So um, as reform was initiated in 2014, it started being implemented in 2015. And uh, the algorithm looked something like that. At first, the head of uh, the local territorial community had to um, um, 
create this initiative that we are going to decentralize. After that, this decision had to be uh, approved by the local legislative body. And once they agreed that they are going to decentralize, the decision was sent to the regional level authorities, to central authorities. If they approved what was going on, the decision was sent back. And then um, all territorial communities that were about to be amalgamated or united had to create a special working group that um, conducted uh, public hearings and discussions things like this. Once they reached a, you know, some sort of a decision, this decision had to be approved by the local legislature again, then executive order followed. And after that, it was either up to the executive order of the local authorities to finalize the whole process, or in some cases, even um, a referenda were held in um, several regions where the decision was quite contested. So this is how it was working technically at the administrative level. And then like the second goal of the reform was obviously the fiscal reform. The centralization is always about fiscal reform. So Hermano or territorial community in Ukraine um, was able after the reform to keep uh, the majority of locally collected taxes. So these are three main categories, but there were so much more. Um, like they were keeping 60% of personal income tax, 100% of property tax, 100% of the single tax. Why does it even matter? Well, previously, locally collected taxes were sent to the central authorities and then they were redistributed to, uh, the, at the local level, which, as you can imagine, um, gets kind of complicated and very intransparent very quickly. So the idea of the decentralization reform uh, was to fix that. Um, okay, so this is the map uh, published by the Ministry of Community and Territory Development of Ukraine, aka Decentralization Ministry. And uh, on this map, they, um, uh, which was published in July 2020, so by basically by the end of the reform, they were showing that everything that was blue were uh, those um, um, communities that happened to be decentralized at that point, and everything that was yellow, those were non-decentralized. And they had a very specific deadline in the end of 2020. Everybody who didn't make it voluntarily was forced to decentralize after that. And at this point, the reform was over. So basically, we are looking at the six years of very intense decentralization reform in Ukraine. Just uh, to note, my data is a little bit different. My sample is smaller because I'm looking mostly at the urban um, areas rather than at the rural areas. You can imagine that territorial, there are much more um, rural territorial communities than urban ones. Um, the spread, geographical spread, basically looks the same, uh, but the difference is that I was able to trace like um, party politics, which would be impossible in, at the village level, mostly because party affiliation kind of got missing after the reform, and I'll talk about it in a moment. So there was no, no particular year in the decentralization history of Ukraine that was kind of stood out in terms of the number of communities that decided to um, decentralize. So it all started very humble with um, um, like 100 communities, a little bit over 100 communities decentralized in 2015. And then there was this steady development up to 2020, um, um, you know, to the point that we observed in the previous slide. So um, if we look at the geographical spread over time, you can see that, um, Overall, the geographical spread was also quite even. So it started in the east and the west of Ukraine, and you know, the number of decentralized communities was kind of multiplying across regions. Um, I often get asked, "What is this gray zone? Is uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone? Is radioactive to decentralize?" And then you can see that um, for eastern parts of Ukraine, were at this point already occupied, and Crimea obviously annexed. So uh, nothing special was going on here. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this little appendix of Ukraine, this is um, um, Odessa region that is neighboring Transnistria. Those who are following news right now know that this is a problematic region as well at the moment. So um, there is an obvious question, who decentralized first? Okay, we know that it was kind of even in the East and the West, but was there anything weird going, going on there? And my answer is yes. Yeah. So based on my 
sample of urban communities, I'm kind of, I, I'm obviously observing that uh, poorer communities were the first to decentralize. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Um, if your budget is not enough, your current budget is not enough to satisfy your budgetary needs, your spending needs, well, you will do something and what you will do well, engage in a reform that will allow you to keep um, the uh, higher percentage of locally collected taxes local and then to be able to spend this money appropriately. And um, as the reform was uh, developing, um, richer communities also stepped in. So my y-axis here is basically budgetary spending, total budgetary spending per capita. I basically divided it by population just to um, avoid the situation when we have like big cities outliers uh, spending way too much. But obviously there are very rich communities, um, which are obvious outliers that um, decentralized pretty early in the process. But overall, there is this kind of obvious trend that um, uh, rich communities stepped in at a later point. So let's look at this very nice, I think, uh, case. And I, I really ask you to keep this case in mind because you will see it in the end of my presentation as well. So this is a bishop uh, community, which is located not far from the capital city of Kiev. So um, this community was really late to decentralize. They decentralized in July of 2020, uh, right before that map that I showed you earlier was created. And uh, immediately after uh, uh, the adoption of the reform, their income into their budget increased twice. And the reason why this happened is because they, uh, in addition to the local taxes that they had before, they also added all these additional taxes that the fiscal reform guaranteed. So population income tax, excise tax, single tax, property tax, and many others. So yes. Yeah. So was there like was there any corresponding loss in redistribution of revenue from the central government in this period of time? Uh, well, yes, obviously, because uh, and uh, I will later show you spend budgetary spending, and you actually see like a very sharp dip right after the introduction of the reform. So between two thousand fifteen and two thousand sixteen, and that was because of this lack of redistribution and inability of local communities to learn fast enough to, to learn to distribute by themselves without this input from the central government. Right, okay, but so that's so that's spending and that's a separate story about yeah. why it was hard to get the spending out. But like, is there, when you say it's double, like the budget that they had it, in this community, the total amount of money they had at their disposal, I assume that didn't double because this must've been offset by, by a decrease in transfer from the center. Yes. Yes. So the uh, so the was it intended to be revenue neutral? Was it intended to be less money, more money staying in the central government, less money going to localities? Was it like a money saving move for the central government, or was it supposed to be more money going out to localities generally? So the whole idea was to make sure that a more money stays local at the expense, obviously, of the central uh, of the central authorities, right? So. Um, in this case, when I say that income uh, of the budget doubled, it means that um, the income of the budgets of the uh, higher level, so in this case, it will be a regional budget, oblast budget, it obviously decreased. Does it make sense? Right, but what I'm asking is like, okay, I'll go, go on and I'll see if I still have the question later. Can I ask okay. it differently? Because yeah, I think that's important. So is this just the income that the Romada itself raises. In addition to that, there's probably also transfers that they get from high level governments, right? And the question is, if if a unit decentralizes, do they lose access to the funds received from let's say regional government or the central government? Yes. Okay. Right. So that's so, so that's, that's not yeah. okay. So that's not change in budget, right? That's not the de facto budget they have. That's only the income that they raise yes. locally. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. I... So the budget might still remain the same. Yes, the, uh, the, uh, there wasn't a sharp increase in the total budget, but that, that's what I was asking. Yes. Is it was it in, was the reform intended to be revenue budget neutral? Like at the same, at the end of the day, the total budget would be about the same, more or less. So uh, yes, in the end of the day, the total budget um, 
was um, at first designed to be the same, but um, as I will show okay. also in a minute, uh, the idea of the decentralization reform was to give incentives to uh, local residents to actually pay more taxes, and that happened as well, okay. because they were basically shamed by their neighbors for not paying. Um, so in the long run, um, total budgetary revenue increased because of the increase of taxes people paid. But uh, in the short term, obviously, that was not happening. There was a like, three-year delay on average in the effect. Okay, so my main question here, though, is um, how does decentralization reform affect electoral outcomes? More specifically, uh, how does decentralization reform affect turnout in local elections? And how does it change the main characteristics of the successful uh, candidates? My main argument is twofold. First, I'm saying that uh, the centralization reform actually provided voters with incentives to show up and vote. And um, the reason um, that I'm providing is that basically people were very interested in controlling local authorities because all of a sudden, um, the way local taxes are being collected and spent, so the way that budgetary politics are being managed, all of a sudden it became a local issue. Uh, previously, it was up to regional authorities to decide all the things. So it was kind of irre irrelevant whether you show up to local elections or not. But um, decentralization provided incentives to people to actually care whether local authorities have been accountable, transparent, honest, and generally effective. The next thing that I'm arguing is that uh, decentralization broke the connections between the local authorities and the central authorities. And especially in terms of party politics. And that provided um, certain candidates that would never have a chance of winning elections with an actual chain, the chance of winning elections. So a more diverse group of candidates entered politics, became successful candidates as a result of um, the, the reform. So um, the, like decentralization is why we cite the study topic. There is nothing um, like, I cannot claim that this is something unique um, happening in Ukraine, we know a lot about decentralization. We know that decentralization is associated with the increase of new candidates in the, the electoral competition. Um, my twist on this is whether those candidates are successful or not. Uh, it's empowering uh, territorial subdivisions of national level parties. Um, new parties are emerging and um, there is a development of regional mass media. Well, I'm focusing on voter mobilization and what it means for the diversity of the candidates. Um, I'm, I was using only uh, publicly available uh, data for this uh, project. So I was relying a lot on the decentralization uh, data published by the government of Ukraine. So it's decentralization .com.ua. I highly encourage you to go uh, to this website to actually learn about um, the war on Ukraine. Uh, they they rebranded this a lot since the time I collected this data, but uh, that's just a side note. I was using State Service of Statistics of Ukraine for um, uh, budgetary data, uh, the Ukrainian self-governance website, Gromada Info, and uh, the Electoral Commission of Ukraine. Interestingly enough, uh, this uh, Romana.info is a, a user-generated um, database of decentralization. And uh, in many cases, it was inconsistent uh, in terms of timing of decentralization and things like this with this official government data. So I actually had to double check, check whether uh, uh, decentralization infor information was accurate. Um, Luckily for me, uh, as people say right now, Ukraine is a digital state. So there is a lot of extra resources available for, um, for checking. Yeah, could you please remind me one more time why some places were not decentralized? Because I see that poor uh, places were centralized first, right? That's what you claim, please. But why some places were not? So since the process was voluntary in its basis, you, you kind of could decide to decentralize right away or to wait for five years. It was up to local uh, authorities to decide whether they want to break their ties with central authorities or not. And you can think of multiple reasons they might decide to do so. Uh, my data does not reveal their hidden incentives. Uh, I guess you would need to run a survey or something similar for that. But uh, based on anecdotal evidence available online, we can argue that 
There were cases when uh, uh, local residents opposed decentralization because of all the prejudices it created, like creating of this, um, like they were afraid that decentralization will lead to a local uh, level autocrats being formed, you know, being independent from the central authorities. Uh, people were afraid that corruption corruption will pro proliferate as a result of decentralization. There are other studies, not mine, that is arguing that the opposite happened. Um, also, a very, very big issue for many Ukrainians was that since communities were being amalgamated, so enlarged, they will lose access to vital services such as daycares or schools for their children because those schools would be located not in their village but in the neighboring village. Um, there were also people, um, there were also local level authorities being really dependent on, um, on central level authorities. I mean, for, for quite a while, Ukraine was essentially a client of the state. So we can imagine um, very private incentives of private uh, government, uh, private um, city council has or like church or community has just trying to avoid it at any cost. Um, so there, there are so many reasons why they would decide to wait and not go there. Um, but uh, unfortunately, at least within my research design, those are kind of Okay, so um, I uh, um, my analysis uh, shows that actually um, the um, uh, electoral effects of uh, the decentralization reform were successfully significant, but not very substantially significant. I mean, like the uh, decentralization increased turnout in local elections by 4.2%. If you think about local elections, that's a lot, but it's not enough to change the outcome of elections, given that Ukraine currently has like supreme majority in the parliament, right? So, and the same was happening at the local level. However, you can see that, uh, so my uh, decentralized areas are marked here by the uh, green dashed line, you know, uh, compared to counterfactual, this hypothetical world in which they did not decentralize, uh, turnout defi definitely increased. In addition, uh, decentralization decreased the percentage of successful candidates with higher education and the percentage of successful candidates with party affiliation. So these two things basically suggest that this is a different group that existed before. You don't need to have connections to the central uh, party um, officials in order to win elections or like you need, but at a lower level. And actually, uh, you know, you don't have to be from a well family uh, with higher education, with certain like background in order to become um, a local, um, um, a, a local, a locally elected official. Interestingly enough, Decentralization reform, at least according to my data, had no effect on female representation. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, if you read a little bit on gender politics in Ukraine, you know Ukraine has a problem there. It was not solved. Just you, like my diversity is not about that. Yeah, sorry, but in general, most part affiliation in uh, local politicians in Ukraine like a uh, widespread thing. Yes, it was very widespread thing before the election. So before uh, before the reform, before the reform, approximately uh, on average, eighty percent of locally elected officials were affiliated with the uh, large parties, and the rest, twenty percent of successful officials, ran as independents. After um, after the reform, um, it fell by six point seven percent. So we still have a very high percentage, and I'm explaining uh, this um, phenomenon by the fact that uh, the are you affiliated with the pre current president of Ukraine? It's actually very, very popular. Still remains very popular, and it was very popular in 2020 when the local elections were held. So people just use that. So what's the ration? Sorry, what's the underlying mechanism that you think is happening here? I mean, I've seen lots of papers like this when people do their reforms made to changes to the electoral laws, right? So it doesn't seem like the barriers to running should have changed since we didn't change the electoral laws. So is this a, a whole size demand? Is, is the idea that the local government is now seen as more important and therefore more people who are in locality, you know, who are local and I'm trying, I want to understand what the, what the mechanism is or not even just like, what, what do you think is happening that drives fewer, fewer in, the, you know, cause the, uh, the, right. What we want to rule out is that it's not some third thing that was actually affecting which places decided to decentralize and 
where non-party candidates were more were more successful. So what's the story that gets us to this non-party candidates being more successful? I was just about to jump into that in a moment, but oh, okay. But for no, no, no. we're going to get to the next slide, that's fine. No, no, but for the purposes of answering your question, uh, right. let's just consider a hypothetical situation. I'm not referring to any specific, ter specific territorial community here, just for right. uh, as an example. So um, historically, there were uh, uh, in Ukraine, tax evasion was a very big thing, um, mostly because of post-Soviet legacy. You know, um, this, the USSR collapsed. Um, tax culture was just not there. And, um, you know, this was a widely accepted um, behavior in the society. If you await taxes, like, as my neighbor, I'm not going to judge you, even though it's kind of obvious that you have this huge house and you're paying with, for this huge house, probably with your informal income that is not being taxed in any way. But then the decentralization reform is happened and all of a sudden the message is, uh, you know what? We're going to take all 60% of all those income taxes, personal income taxes, and we're going to put them into, let's say, the development of local road infrastructure or daycares or hospitals, you name it. And my reasoning as a poor neighbor basically is the following that you know what? I really want my rich neighbor to be taxed. And I know that this person is evading taxes. How do I do that? Well, I need to elect someone who will actually be interested in doing this. What kind of person could it be? Well, it should be a person that is closer to me in a, in a profile that is not affiliated with like oligarchs or large parties or even central authorities. Someone who actually has a very similar agenda as me and I will provide a couple of examples with like, like anecdotal evidence. I, and that actually means that I have to turn out <laughs> and vote. You know, I, I can't have to, like in the past, people would mostly vote in national level elections, presidential elections, parliamentary elections, but right now, local elections is what actually matters. Yes. So did you check if, let's say, more independent candidates ran in those elections? Is it demand effect or is it supply effect? So it could be that, you know, the preferences for party affiliated versus independent candidates remain the same, but it's just there was an influx of are the unaffiliated candidates. Did you, could you distinguish between the supply and demand in this, in this regard? Yeah, that's a very good comment. I did not do that in my analysis and I will definitely do, I, I see. And this, the other point I wanted to mention while we we're on this slide is 4.2%. Uh, so Josh would comment more of course because he has worked on turnout directly, but that does not seem like a small effect. Like usually, but even like uh, sort of experimental studies, if they can shift it by one or two percentage points, usually that's considered to be quite quite successful. So I wouldn't say that 4.2, especially given that the average turnout by 2020 is less than 40% from this graph. That seems like pretty sizable effect to me. I wouldn't rule out rule it out as being substantively small. Just a comment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. Do, do you know the results not only for local elections but the parliamentary or presidential that could be kind of placebo test or in some way? Yeah, so um, in my other uh, paper, not this one, I actually um, looked into the results of the national level elections. It was a little, I, the, I would say that uh, it's, it's a worse test for my hypothesis because um, I would have to aggregate basically, um, and, you know, I would take a region and would argue, well, there is a certain percentage of communities that decentralize here. It's not like either decentralized or non-decentralized. And basically uh, there the idea is the same that, um, so there was no effect on uh, the uh, turnout. <laughs> Um, they were the same, but um, uh, we can see that uh, the diversity of uh, candidates uh, changed slightly with mostly like younger people being elected. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, is campaign finance track very closely for local elections? I'm mostly wondering like if non-affiliated candidates were able to win a higher percentage of elections. They're probably not as well funded as like party affiliated. Um, Candidates, and I'm wondering if it's now like people to win an election, which is probably better for democracy, big picture. 
Yeah, so um, basically there is no data set that would track every candidate and how much this person spent on elections, but based on the anecdotal evidence and also fact-checking agencies in Ukraine, so there is one big, big one, which is called Slovo Idilo, like word and action. Um, so they were they were checking what this uh, what these candidates were doing and basically they were um, less spending on like billboards and TV advertisement and things like this because like local level elections allow you to jump on the doors and do that for free. So, uh, and this is uh, something that many candidates were doing. Uh, well, they were not knocking on the doors, but basically they know everyone in their community because they were born there. So there is no need for them to actually advertise themselves. Like people like really know them for certain actions. And some of those, Things are kind of like odd, and I will also cover it in a moment. Thank you. Any more questions about this? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just one small question. Do you do you look at um, the composition of um, uh, so like uh, spendings, local spendings, like because uh, according to your theory, it would be consistent that the they will decrease like administration costs and increase costs on health and. Uh, uh, I don't know, education, infrastructure. Actually, very good point. Thank you very much for allowing us to move forward. Yes, uh, the um, expenditures on uh, administrative costs decreased. They are not on this slide, but I can talk about total budgetary spending and welfare spending in particular. So overall, uh, budget, total budgetary spending was increasing in Ukraine over time. There are many, many reasons for that. And um, this, this graph is actually designed to show you this delaying effect that I was talking about earlier. So um, even though the reform was um, um, implemented in 2015, it took two years for, for things to actually start to be changing. There was like an obvious delaying effect. And you can see that treated, which is my red line here. So decentralized communities actually uh, increased their uh, total spending substantively in comparison to uh, those that did not decentralize. And it gets even more interesting if we look at the uh, wealth of budgetary spending. Again, that's a, an average. Um, so uh, with uh, the budgetary spending right after the um, reform, there was this general feeling that um, welfare spending should increase. You know, it's like this, uh, a Soviet legacy in Ukraine, like we need to spend more, spend more on retirement, on daycare, on like things like this. And then there was a drop when people finally understood that they have to change something about their budgets and about their spending if they actually want to implement specific projects. And um, so again, there was like this delay in learning. And again, you can see that by 2020, there was a pretty substantive difference between those who decentralized and those who did not, with decentralized communities spending much more than non-decentralized communities. So, um, so yes, um, decentralization reform had a very distinct effect on how people spend uh, their budgetary funds, not only how they get them. And um, well, my argument here is that actually um, uh, those who decided to decentralize or early, were better off in terms of um, redistribution um, by um, 2020. All right, so this is just a repetition of the same argument. You can see that if we compare our control and trigger group, like, and we compare 20, uh, 2015 to 2020, there was a substantive difference uh, between uh, the treatment and the control group uh, in terms of um, total budgetary spending and to be even more specific, welfare budgetary spending. But you, you expect that the counterfactual will be parallel, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so this is uh, those that did not decentralize. The green one is those that decentralized. And uh, this is parallel counterfactual as, as if those that, that decentralized did not decentralize. Like I like we would expect if we expected no effect, they would just move along, so to say. And interestingly enough, we uh, I uh, I mentioned before that those who decentralized were on the average poor. Well, that's exactly the illustration of this point. As you can see, at 2015, on average, those who uh, were about to decentralize 
were spending less on welfare and like generally than those who decided to stay the way the way they were. But you measure poorness by spending, not by incomes. Uh, yeah, this is only about spending here. But um, uh, when I was showing the previous one, that was also about in uh, income. But you know, it's proportional. Like the more you get, the more you spend. Um, sometimes, okay, yeah, I I get <laughs> skepticism. So um, so I'm arguing that uh, decentralization reform actually brought new faces into Ukrainian politics. And this is exactly you know, why we observe increased turnout and why we observe this increased diversity. And this new faces is a catchphrase in Ukrainian politics. The idea is that we need someone new. Like this picture is from, uh, from a, a photo um, gallery exhibition um, of like important activists and politicians who were brought to power by um, by decentralization reform, so this is something, and like it was funded by the Ministry of um, uh, of uh, Territorial Development in Ukraine. But you know, like I want to be a little bit more specific of what those new faces look like. So I decided to provide you with two interesting cases. So this uh, uh, man, his name is Oleg Savchuk, and he uh, was elected as a head of the territorial community in Berlin region. Uh, it, it's it's basically the most western part of Ukraine. It's as far to the west as possible. So at the time of the election, he was just 24 years old. And the logical question would be, how did he make it? Well, before that, he was a farmer working in his uh, father's business. And then when decentralization reform happened and there was uh, there were local elections happening in his community, his his father's friends encouraged him to to run for elections. So he, he was, did not belong to the political establishment, but he belonged to the farmer's establishment of this community. Uh, you could argue that uh, given that he was one of the landowners, well, you can't own land in Ukraine, but he was one of the business owners in, in the community. He, he had some access to financial resources, but nevertheless, he's 24 years old. And um, why did he, they encourage him to run was because he was known for very small, but very specific infrastructures projects in his community. For example, he is a creator of a three feet tall uh, swing. <laughs> why would you need it? And like, why, why did it make him stand up? And nevertheless, it was part of his um, electoral program. Like I built that swing. Um, and, and he was like, trying to attract swing voters. <laughs> wow, <Okay>. good one. <laughs> yeah, well, his idea was that he was trying to attract tourists because he, he saw a similar swing in the Kabasian Mountains and like there are tourists there. This guy actually won elections and um, after that he com continued working on very small infrastructural projects. For example, one of his biggest achievements are um, making a um, rural population to recycle. I mean, you know, they, they are distributing and recycled bins and stuff like that. So, you know, like he, he is very focused on that. Um, he, um, so this, this was a picture when he was invited to some EU institution to talk after the beginning of the war. And when asked about this experience, he said that he, his English is not good enough to, to participate and like, that's not his thing. But, you know, but nevertheless, he's apparently very efficient at the local level for small infrastructure projects. And this is exactly what the reform is supposed to be about. Well, um, this case is kind of like uh, different because this is the case of how locally elected officials uh, contributed to the um, uh, people's resilience after the full scale, scale invasion of Ukraine. So. The name of this man is Stanislav Zakharevich, and he was elected as head of a uh, territorial community in um, in the eastern part, southeastern part of Ukraine in Zaporizhia, the one that uh, was occupied and is still occupied by the Russian military. So this is him before he was kidnapped by the Russian military, and this is after. So he survived um, 34 days in the torture chamber, and um, just like the previous one, he was just 29 years old when elected. He had no political profile, no connections. And interestingly enough, he's considered to be a poor 
a member of his community, so he didn't really have much money to run. Um, but he was known as a local um, activist, and once he was elected, he was known for pretty standard, yet pretty incredible, I think, local projects, like he built, he built a new house facility in his um, community, he built a new daycare in his community, things like this. So after the full-scale invasion, and just to note, like his territorial community was occupied on the third day of the invasion, so it's not like they had a chance to escape or like to do anything really. And um, he organized a territorial self-defense, which was very different from what you think. When you think about territorial defense, they had no weapons, they had no real way to resist. These were just a bunch of young men walking around and like helping as volunteers. For example, they organized food deliveries or like delivery of yeast so that people can actually bake their own bread, stuff like that. So it was very basic. However, um, two months into occupation, he was kidnapped. And the reason why he was kidnapped, he would never claim this, was because the um, Russian military tried to persuade him through torture to become uh, the uh, acting mayor of Primorsk, um, a neighboring city. So they wanted local authorities cooperate with them and they thought that that was the best way to proceed. Um, so he was kept for 34 days in the torture chamber where he consistently refused to cooperate with the occupational forces. And then um, uh, administrative authorities from Russia started um, arriving into the region and they started asking um, this has of decentralized communities to extract certain data. So the data they wanted from him was um, the list of local politicians and the list of people on welfare. Welfare kind of all of a sudden becomes important here because um, they were preparing for the referendum, which took place later on. And as they were preparing for this referendum, they wanted the list of uh, people on like retirement benefits, social benefits, stuff like that. So the people that they could pressure. So he was supposed to deliver those and he escaped while delivering those. Um, interestingly enough, on his way to the Ukraine-controlled territories, he was uh, stopped 12 times by the Russian military, but none of them could believe that he was actually the head of the territorial community due to his young age. And that's what helped him to escape. So that's just like, that's how your diversity <laughs> helps you to escape um, the situation. So, he escaped and he continues currently to work in Zaporizhia as the head of his own territorial community. In this picture, he is actually uh, delivering uh, uh, food, uh, food um, supplies to, his, um, to the residents of his territorial community. So, um, so nothing changed in, in, in terms of his um, administrative work, just that the, he is not in the territory that is currently being occupied by Russians. Um, so, these two cases are very personal, and the question is, how does it look at the aggregate level? And um, this, um, this is a survey that was conducted in August 2022 after the invasion of Ukraine by Alexandra Kudel and uh, uh, Oksana Kuz. And basically, they sent out this uh, survey uh, questions to the heads of territorial community of Ukraine, asking how they engage with the population. if there are no elections, right? I'm like the whole, my whole presentation is about voter mobilization, but uh, currently, you know, voting is happening. And this is the list of answers they came, came up with. Basically, they are saying that they are communicating with local residents to make sure like they know what kind of assistance is needed, that uh, they know, uh, like uh, that they provide emotional support, they provide, uh, they coordinate volunteers, uh, they still keep fighting with corruption. So, and you can see that like the total percentages are pretty high. Like it's like 80 to 90% of the local territorial communities actually doing this work. How does it compare to what they were doing before war? So this um, graph, again, not mine, by, uh, but Kerylos and Kus, um, compares um, their survey run in 2021 to their survey run in 2022. In both, they ask the same questions. And uh, basically they are trying to understand how did this engagement of uh, local residents slash business owners slash NGOs change as, um, um, as the war is going on? And you can see that the engagement of residents actually dropped in the majority of cases 
Uh, they are explaining it by the fact that people just left the country. They are not there to engage. However, local businesses and NGOs stayed, and their engagement in a variety of question, uh, areas actually increased. So we can argue that decentralization actually led not only to voter mobilization, but also to the voter engagement in between elections. Since we do not know when the next elections are happening due to the war period, um, uh, war period. Um, this is very important that uh, they are engaging in important consultation, dialogue, and partnership, uh, no matter how we define those. So, um, also, this is just an interesting uh, side thing that I learned recently about territorial communities. Currently, it's up to local authorities to define how they are going to rebuild and where they are going to get money from. <laughs> So what they are doing, they are actually signing bilateral agreements with cities all over the world. So local authorities with local authorities on how they are going to uh, uh, rebuild. For example, a city in, in the US can commit to rebuilding a school in, uh, I don't know, in Bucha, as an example. And if we zoom in, uh, these are mostly Central and Western European um, uh, uh, Western Ukrainian uh, territorial communities doing this, mostly with Eastern Europe because it's like easier to engage. But I believe as the war goes on and uh, more and more territorial communities learn about this mechanism, uh, we will see more connectedness in Central and Eastern Europe. And these look like they're not just one to one, it can be one to many. They can solve Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah, because like, uh, so um, for example, Amsterdam committed to rebuilding at one particular school in Bucha, but all schools in Bucha were destroyed, like most of them. So you need multiple connections to multiple cities so that they, you get all your schools rebuilt. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, just uh, so so by now all of them are decentralized. Would it be possible to check and say that the communities that decentralized earlier, so they have a longer history, right, of this local self governance, that they would be more active in seeking out and finding these bilateral links, right? Like I think it would be useful to make some comparison of centralized versus decentralized because everything you're showing us now is already sort of de facto decentralized, so we do not know. Like whether this is picture, this picture is due to decentralization or not, right? So I totally agree with you, and that's exactly what I'm currently working on. I'm trying to collect as many variables as possible regarding this uh, territorial community's um, work after war. I actually got access to the survey that I referred earlier to all questions that they asked and all answers. So I know, like, at the territorial community level, who said what. So currently, I'm trying to use all this data to actually write a paper about like post like wartime resilience um, of and like the effect of decentralization. But it's still work in progress, so it's not presented here. There's just one other little interesting piece of data. It looked to me like there were some of them that were partnering with cities in China on oh, the yeah. previous map. So I think that I was briefing people today on the war. I mean, and this is like the question everybody is asking right now is what about China? What is China doing? And, you know, everybody's focused right now and the media is focused on Xi's visit to Moscow. But this is an interesting, you know, like a lot of the story is about China trying to like play both sides of everything. And this is kind of interesting. If you have Chinese cities lining up to rebuild Ukraine at the same time that Xi is in Moscow and the rest of the world is speculating about whether he's giving the Russians weapons to destroy cities in Ukraine. Like, that's actually very interesting. I don't know if it has anything to do with this particular paper, but like, it's an interesting piece of data. I totally agree with you. I just uh, learned that the Chinese recently brokered a peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And uh, are they trying to prevent Iranians from sending drones or are they trying to actually allow them to do that? Through this, um, through this agreement. So there, there are a lot of questions here. You can see that not that many Chinese cities are committed to rebuilding. Cities. But it might be it might be worth an hour of time. Is, like, are they all? Is there something about like? Can you chase trace where those Chinese cities are doing to where the Belt Road Initiative was in Ukraine? Like where? And I know there was a lot of Chinese trade with Ukraine prior to the war. I don't know how much of it has survived. Is this just a? Is this just an offshoot of the pre-existing trading networks, or, you know? I, I'm kind of like, I'm curious, like what Xi thinks about Chinese cities committing to building, rebuilding. I mean, maybe it, it works perfectly with overall strategy. I don't know. I'll, I'll drop it for now, but I just think it's very, I was surprised to see that. I think there's something, there's some, there's a there there that would be worth learning more about. Actually, Chinese business law 
lost a lot from right. this whole war. Like they they actually signed certain agreements about land use in Crimea right before it was annexed. So it was like immediate blow for them. And as the war was going on, they definitely suffered. So um, yeah, I, I agree that there is something to discover here, definitely, especially in terms of international yeah. relations. I mean, it might be a story more about Chinese internal politics, Ukrainian internal yeah. politics, but I, I would be interested yeah. to learn more. But those agreements are available in free access, so you actually can know what they committed to, like if, you know, whether it's like a daycare or like a hospital or whatever. Okay, so um, remember Bishop, the territorial community I told you about in a capital uh, region that was really late to, uh, to um, decentralize? Well, they suffered a lot. Um, right after they decentralized, they invested a lot of locally collected and kept taxes into building a daycare and like renewing a daycare, which is called Chesapeake. And this is what happened to this daycare right after the invasion. And uh, the question was, ha, what do you do with this? Since this is currently de-occupied territory. So nothing was happening while they were occupied. But then immediately there was a question whether something can be done. And I'm happy to report that at this moment, this daycare is fully functional and fully rebuilt. Where did they get money from? Not from the Chinese but from a very unusual source. At first, they start, uh, tried using their local budget to cover the cost, but then it, it immediate, like, almost immediately, it was clear that it's not enough. So they went to Sorkis Brothers, who are very well-known Ukrainian oligarchs, to fund the whole thing. And this is just one day here, so I don't think that for oligarchs it was a huge expense. But they actually rebuilt it, and the daycare reopened on the 22nd of December 2022, so pretty fast for a rebuilding uh, effort. So, uh, you know, uh, this decentralized communities get, even, even those who were uh, laid to decentralize get very, very creative in terms of how they can rebuild. And uh, as we can see in some cases, they're quite effective and fast. <clears throat> so what are the takeaways? Um, I would argue that decentralization increased the importance of local elections, whether people actually care about them or not, and whether they vote in them or not. They also changed the, an average profile of a successful candidate, allowing people who had no chance of winning in the past to actually try to run and to win. And finally, I think that uh, decentralization, I argue that decentralization had a positive effect on Ukrainians' resilience in the face of war. Uh, this is all that I have. Um, thank you very much for our uh, time. And yeah, we can so returning to oligarchs before the war, Ukraine was kind of oligarch, oligarchically captured economy, right? So it could be that actually oligarchs could oppose or invest into this process of decentralization. Because I'm wondering, like, could it be the case? What is the interest of oligarchs in this policy? So uh, I would argue that oligarchs were um, very invested into the process. Um, especially those who had uh, businesses in territorial communities that wanted to decentralize early in the process, and then they would lose access to special tax benefits or like, you know, uh, to, spe to, uh, to special perks they were getting through their connection with regional authorities. Um, so I, I don't want to go specific into the names because I, I don't want to like make up some facts since I don't remember them straight, but there were regions in Ukraine where local governors were trying to prevent local authorities from decentralizing, and there were um, allegations that those governments were governors were affiliated with certain oligarchs, right? So oligarchs were invested. However, I would argue that uh, since they were trying to influence the whole process through central authorities, who were losing their influence because of the decentralization reform. You know, it was it was not particularly effective, right? And uh, you know, as we can see currently, um, local uh, authorities are actually uh, trying to establish these connections with uh, foundations uh, established by oligarchs. So oligarchs are still there; they are still important. But um, recent changes in political atmosphere in Ukraine kind of made it more difficult for them to have this direct influence on local politics as they used to have in the past. So 
you spoke briefly when you were answering a question about why some people were objecting to decentralization. And one of the fears was the, the, the capture, right? The capture of the locality by, let's say, local elites, local influential families, sort of. Uh, so a lot of your story was very positive in a sense, like outlining like good effects of decentralization. Based on your research, to what degree those fears were actually justified? Were there enough cases where indeed it resulted in sort of local, more so, sort of semi-authoritarian, locally captured communities as opposed to you know just very well self-governing communities? So based on uh, my uh, research, I can argue that uh, this fear was not justified in any way. Um, I actually so. Uh, in my research, I can see that many, many independent candidates were actually the majority of candidates who were successful were independent, not affiliated with large parties or businesses. Actually, um, you know, um, business ownership did not help them to get elected um, in the most recent elections, and I have uh, analysis for that. So I would say that um, you know, um, this local autocrats, uh, they they just do not exist as a large-scale phenomenon. However, I tried checking uh, Google News uh, database for the reports when uh, local uh, residents were reporting that there was this capture of power in their locality, and I actually found two instances. Um, I did this back in 2021, so I would have to check what happened to those two autocrats um, in the post, well, in the ongoing war world. Uh, but yes, so it's not impossible for an local autocrat to emerge, but um, as at the moment, it's very unlikely that um, this is a large scale phenomenon. All right, so if we don't have any more questions, thank you very much, Anastasia, for your, for your great presentation. <laughs>